What's good, y'all? Welcome back to the Playmakers Corner Podcast. My name is Simon Villanos, a.k.a. Coach V, and I had the privilege of going down to CSU Pueblo, the Thunder Bowl, for this Fort Morgan versus Meade 3A State Championship game. The winner, obviously, would be your 2021 3A State Champs. And so, you know, before I head into this game, you know, this was going to be a good one. Fort Morgan, man, they've had a very good season so far. We knew what they were going into this season. We knew they'd have an explosive offense with a lot of athletes, you know, on the offensive and defensive side of the ball. But this team is led by the likes of the quarterback, Briggs Wheatley, first off. Uh, and then you have Frank Ortega, Brandon Fajardo, who we knew in the preseason would definitely contribute a bit there. And so Fort Morgan was one of those teams that, uh, honestly, we did in name as a contender in the preseason, but we did mention them as a team that you had to look out for because they're a squad that can make some noise here. And, you know, that's what they did. In the regular season, for the most part, they dominated, especially at the beginning of the season. Near the end, they played some tougher teams, lost to Roosevelt 14-7, to barely, just barely beat Northridge 23-20. to uh, Not a bad squad by any means, though. Then went on, blew out the Holy Family 49-30 to before heading into the playoffs. In the playoffs, they're close, or they had a lot of close games. I'm just going to be honest with you, so I'm not going to say uh, this state championship game was their closest game of the season. But, you know, beat Green Mountain 14-0. to Beat Frederick, who was getting hot, not going to lie. Um, they actually beat this me team in their last regular season game. Uh, but they beat Frederick 21-14. to And then last week, they did beat Lutheran 23-21 to in an absolute thriller. So there you go. And so that was their path to Pueblo, to the state championship game. Now let me talk about Meade here for a little bit before we head into the actual game. Meade, on the other hand, was actually my pick to go to state and to win state in the preseason. I think that's something that a lot of people forgot. Even I forgot for a little bit here. And, you know, they had kind of an up and down season. Started the season real strong. You know, their first four games, basically, they won by 30 plus points. They're all blowouts. That's against uh, Pueblo Centennial, Discovery Canyon, Northridge, Lewis Palmer. Then they go to Johnstown to play Roosevelt. This would be their first kind of tough game of the season. Roosevelt was obviously Cody's pick to go ahead and win 3A back in the preseason. And I was actually at this game, and, you know, Roosevelt, they took care of business. Really, you know, they allowed that one touchdown in their opening drive. And other than that, you know... Had a little bit of a slow start, but Roosevelt would take over that second half and blow them out 37-7. to That was on October 8th, and so it would still be a long season. Meade would bounce back and have a blowout win against Skyview. They would just barely beat Holy Family 35-32. to Then they'd go back and blow out Thompson Valley, and then they would have that shocking blowout loss to Frederick 45-19. to At that point... I'm not even go cap. I was kind of out on Meade. I knew they'd make the playoffs. I knew they'd probably win in the first round. You know, but after that, it would just be up to this team, you know, uh, against all the, I guess, minus Holy Family against all the other teams. Or, well, playoff teams, you know, they didn't do super well against Frederick and Roosevelt. You know, they got blown out. It wasn't even like a close loss. They just got playing blown out. That's what happened. I guess the one real quality win was against Northridge real early on in the season where they beat them 42-0. to But other than that, you know, a very up and down season. And that would kind of carry on as they go into the playoffs. And they would play Northridge at home again. You know, this was the same young squad they blew out a couple weeks ago. And this would be a lot closer. I'm going to give Northridge their credit. They played up. But Meade would pull this one out 21-20 to by 1. And then they would have to go to Durango, play the defending champs in Durango, which is a long drive, you know. Um, but they would beat them 14-13, to another one-point win. So two straight one-point playoff wins before they would have their showdown with Roosevelt. Um, this time, Meade would actually host this one. And so this actually played in their favor. But... They would go ahead and beat Roosevelt 38-21 to in an absolute shocker. So going into this game, Meade is hot. 
off of their big dub over Roosevelt. I think a lot of people were counting them out, including myself in that Roosevelt game, but you know, they would win and they would find themselves in state for the first time ever against a Fort Morgan team, you know, who has been to state and has won it, but it's been a bit since they've won their last state championship. And so there you go. That's the setting of this 3A showdown between Meade and Fort Morgan. Let's hop into this game. So to start this game, there are definitely some nerves, you know, um, I would say on both sides, but it was definitely more obvious on Meade on the kickoff. You know, the the ball was fumbled, actually, and, you know, Meade would recover, but they would end up starting on the 12, so not great, you know, field position right off the bat here to start this game, but doesn't matter. Number seven, Evan Morris, he kind of gets this thing going for me. They feed him the ball a couple times here. Um, on the first play of the game, he gets a nice little 10-yard run on a dive, breaking tackles, you know, running physically as he does. You know, he's kind of been their bell cow all year, so there you go there. On third and one, with about 10 minutes left, they continue to feed Morris here, and he would get that first down for Meade. Um, around the 8 minute 36 second mark, though, this is a key event that would happen. Meade, they're driving at this point. You know, they're getting first downs, they're converting. But on third and short, probably a run play. I mean, well, it is going to be a run play, but probably a run play to Evan Morris here. Uh, Gavin Garrettson does mishandles the snap. I I don't know. I think it just bounced off his hand like he was expecting it, but it was just a little bit too far left or right, you know, and, you know, bounced off his hand and uh, fell to the floor, and so he had to actually jump on that. That would kind of cause a third and long there, which would hurt Meade and would basically end that drive right there. And so they would go ahead and punt to two Fort Morgan, who will get the ball uh, for the first time this game with about eight minutes, 36 seconds left in the first quarter. Now, to get this game started, Briggs Wheatley. You know, he goes ahead and he, he does his thing, man. He's running um, this ball. And by the way, uh, Fort Morgan, they actually had a really good punt return on this one. It was returned to the 35. So they have 35 yards to go before they score a touchdown. So just keep that in mind. But like I said, Briggs Wheatley gets his thing started. Has a nice little 10-yard rush uh, for the first. Now... Fort Morgan is in the end zone. Briggs Wheatley would take it again uh, himself on a quarterback keeper for another 10-yard gain. And so they're knocking on the door here. Um, but with about 6 minutes, 37 seconds left, it is third and two inside the 10 for Fort Morgan. They go with the hot hand. They go with their playmaker on the offensive side of the ball. Briggs Wheatley, he gets the ball on another quarterback keeper, leaps for the first down, reaches out for the first down, and he gets it. And then this drive would basically end at the 5 minute 18 second mark when Frank Ortega would punch it in on a one yard rushing touchdown uh, after the PAT. Fort Morgan would take the lead 7 to 0 as Fort Morgan responds first, uh, capitalizing on great field position. Both, um, I mean, both on that kickoff to Meade and then having that huge punt return that made it a really short field for Fort Morgan. So already, you know, very good job by the special teams here uh, by Fort Morgan. So there you go. Fort Morgan up 7-0 to with five minutes left in the first quarter. Meade will get the ball and, you know, they do what they do best. They run the ball. Five minutes, seven seconds left in the first quarter. Gavin Garrettson has a nice 15-plus yard run for Meade on a design quarterback run. So he goes ahead and does that. But around the three-minute, ten-second mark, it is fourth and two for Meade. Meade is going to be aggressive for most of this game. They go for it a lot here. And so they go for it right here. Gavin Garrettson, quarterback dive, goes ahead and gets that first down just barely, but he goes ahead and gets that first down, and they would cross into Fort Morgan territory. Then at the 1 minute 55 second mark, they got another third and short situation. Third and four right here. Gavin Garrettson, it is a read option play. He decides to take it for himself, goes ahead and gets enough yards for the first down, keeping this drive alive. With 40 seconds left, though, they would go back to their guy, Evan Morris, who would go ahead and get Meade into the red zone with a nice little dive play here for about, yeah, I would say for five plus yards or so. But, unfortunately, at the 13 second mark, Meade would have an illegal shift 
that would not only take away a nice play, but push them back as well, it would still be second down. Uh, Meade would basically go into the second quarter after that penalty. And in the second quarter, ball is on the 19 for Meade. It is second down. So here we go. 11 minutes, 55 seconds left in the second. Gavin Gerritsen on the keeper gets it to the four-yard line for Meade. Then with 11.48, Evan Morris would go ahead and dive in for the touchdown, making it 7-7 seven to seven after the PAT. A nice little drive here for Meade after their first drive of the game. Didn't work out, so there you go there. It is a tied game right now. Now, with 9 minutes, 32 seconds, Fort Morgan, they have the ball. You know, they're trying to throw this thing. That's what they do. You know, they have uh, an elite quarterback in Briggs Wheatley, by the way, and a lot of playmakers. They're trying to get this passing game going here so they don't just have to run it with Ortega and Briggs here. And so here is what went down at the 9 minute, 32 second mark. Braden Fajardo, number 33, makes a sensational Odell Beckham-style catch over the middle. He was running a post route, Briggs Wheelie, he kind of just laid it out there, you know, and Braden Fajardo, he just makes an excellent play, skies for it, catches it with one hand for a 40-yard reception here, you know. It was some bad coverage. Some would say even the ball was maybe just a little overthrown here, but Braden Fajardo, it does not matter for him. He makes probably the biggest play of this entire game so far right here with that one-handed 40-yard reception down the middle. So there you go there. Uh, all of a sudden, Fort Morgan is on the other side of the field uh, after that one big play. So there we go there. They are not quite in the red zone yet, though, but they are on the other side of the field. I think that's important to keep in mind, as with 8 minutes, 50 seconds, I'm pretty sure they would run a dive here, and then this would be the second down play. Briggs Wheatley, he escapes a sack multiple times. You know, this me defense early on was getting a really nice pass rush on Fort Morgan. They were putting the pressure on Briggs Wheatley. Um, you know, even when he was completing passes, he was getting hammered all game. This was just a constant thing for him, but he escapes a sack. Uh, pretty sensational there, you know, steps out of one, uh, jukes another guy, and then he throws the ball the ball is tipped, and it is almost picked. It is actually a dropped pick for Meade, I would say. Um, it fell in the hands of two or three guys there, you know, after the tip, that is. And so, that's a little bit of a missed opportunity for me, but does not matter, you know, at the 8 minute 43 second mark, you know, there's a holding that is called on for Morgan, uh, and so it would actually be second and 20 now after that, so for Morgan is definitely struggling here to move the ball after that big play. They tried going for another big play. It is 101 in coverage. Um, I believe it was another post right here. Briggs, he overthrows this one a little bit more, though. The guy was kind of open. It, I mean, not completely open, but he was, you know, he had a step on his defender here. But Briggs, he would not complete that pass. Um, he was also under pressure as well, which is important to keep in mind. Uh, they were getting pressure almost every snap, almost every pass play, and so... Um, would overthrow that one. That would bring up a third and long there, missing that potential touchdown opportunity for Fort Morgan. After that, Briggs would scramble a little bit, make it fourth and 11. Fort Morgan not wanting to take the field goal, they would go for it, but it would be an incomplete pass. The This Meade pass rush, you know, got to him one more time, and so um, I want to say it was batted down or something like that because he was trying to find his check down here. It was either Ortega or Fajardo, and uh, it kind of the ball kind of just died on him, and it, it fell short of the target. So that's kind of how that ended there. Meade would take over right here, and you know what? With 7 minutes, 20 seconds, you know, Meade, they're trying to run the ball but unfortunately it is third and seven kind of a third and long situation they're trying to kind of scheme how to you know figure this one out because I think at this point Meade feels like they have to go for it on fourth down and so they're trying to get a shorter hopefully fourth down situation but they take a little bit too long and this wouldn't be the first time Meade would actually go ahead and call a timeout to avoid the delay. This is their first timeout of the game. So there you go there. And so after the timeout, they would go ahead and run it with Gavin Gerritsen. It's a quarterback dive. He will get a nice, you know, five yards, making it fourth and two. 
they would have their play, but one more time, Meade would actually call a second timeout to avoid another delay. Uh, so there you go, two Meade timeouts to just avoid the delay here back to back. And so here's what happens. They go to Corby Teku on a dive. Can't go wrong with this one. He goes ahead and gets enough yards to get this first down there. Right after that, with about 5 minutes 37 seconds left in the first half, Gavin Garrison goes ahead and finds his guy Evan Morris on a nice little rollout throw. Morris would take that for about 25 plus yards. A good gain right here through the pass. And so that would set Meade up in a pretty good situation on the other side of the field now. Then, with 4 minutes 40 seconds, it is another Third and fourth situation, Morris, he fights for extra yards um, on this dive, but, you know, it's only fourth and two there. They would go ahead and run a dive with him one more time. He would go ahead and get the first down. They would be on the 19, just on the edge of the red zone, but still in the red zone regardless. At the 3 minute 20 second mark, though, Meade would take a final time out here uh, to kind of figure out what to do in the red zone. They would then run an outside run with Sean Medlock, but Briggs Wheatley would come up and get a pretty big tackle for loss here because, uh, you know, he would have gotten free low-key if Briggs wasn't there. And so that forces a second and 16 situation. And so this is followed with a Corby Teku run to the outside. Doesn't quite get there, you know, this Fort Morgan defense playing really well. Um, he would get a couple yards, though, because he would fight for it. But it would only be 3rd and 11 on that outside run. Now, on 3rd down, me, they decide to run a quarterback dive. Gavin Garrettson, he would more so just try to center this one for the field goal. It was obvious what they were going for. Kick would be from about the 25. Meade would kick it. It would be no good. Fort Morgan would take over with about two minutes left in the first half. That was kind of a big one. I I mean, I don't blame them just trying to get points here, but wouldn't have been surprised if they went for it here and tried to keep this drive alive and eventually get a touchdown. But they settle for the field goal, and they do not get it. It's, uh, it's quite short, actually, so, yeah. But, like I said, Fort Morgan, they have the ball. They're driving. It is third and two with about a minute 40 seconds left. Uh, Briggs Wheatley, he goes ahead and he gets the first down, extending this drive for a little bit more here. But with 56 seconds left, Meade would get a huge sack by, I want to say it was number 48. I want to say this was on first down. Uh, this would cause Fort Morgan to go ahead and use a timeout here so that they could stop the clock. But with 30 seconds left uh, in this first half, number two, Nate Murphy, would actually make an excellent diving interception. The ball was tipped at the line, uh, but he would make this excellent diving interception to go ahead and shut down that Fort Morgan offensive drive here, prevent them from getting any more points. Um, and then basically, me, they would try to take a couple shots here to, you know, get, get something going and whatnot because they were on the other side of the field. Um, number 27, he would end up picking off Gavin Garrettson, though, on a deep ball prayer. Uh, and that would end the half. At this point, it is 7-7. It is anybody's game. couple missed opportunities by both teams. You know, obviously, uh, Fort Morgan, they went for it in the red zone on fourth down. Didn't get it. Meade kicked that field goal in the red zone. Didn't get it. So, there you go. 7-7 right here. And to start this third quarter, Fort Morgan would get the ball. But Frank Ortega gets stuffed. At the line on second down, this would bring up a third and ten situation. Uh, Meade, bringing that pass rush, as always, would pressure Briggs Wheatley, and he would end up throwing an incomplete pass. That would force a three and out on the very first Fort Morgan drive. Uh, Meade's defense doing a very good job uh, right here so far. But... Here's what happens. They would punt it to Meade. Uh, they would bobble the punt. And he would just barely recover it. And this is with 10 minutes, 57 seconds left. Barely recovered it, but still recovered it. That's what matters. And so here we go. Meade is driving. They're in a third and one situation after a Sean Medlock dive. 
Corby Taker goes ahead, does his thing, and he gets the first down on the dive, extending this Mead drive here so far. And then Mead would actually get a pretty key pass interference call. Um, they would call it on Fort Morgan, obviously. They would take a deep shot here. It was one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and the ball, I mean, it wasn't the greatest ball in the world. If the DB turned around, he might have had a good chance at picking this one off. But he uh, did not turn around at all. And so they would call a pass interference on for Morgan that would give Meade, you know, a couple more yards. Meade would take over, actually, on the 23 uh, going towards the end zone. So there you go there. They're basically in red zone territory right here. And so they decide to give it off to Corby Teku, who pounds forward for a nice little 10-yard gain. Putting Mead on the 12 yard line. Then Mead, they're trying to run the ball here, but unfortunately it is third and five. They decide to give it to Corby Taku one more time, who would dive and make it a fourth and one. But doesn't matter. Mead would actually go ahead and call a timeout right here and try to game plan what they're going to do next. Um, not not exactly the most creative game plan, but you don't need to be when you have a guy like Corby Teku. They decide to give it to him on a little zone run here. He would basically thrash his way into the end zone and make it a 14-7 to game after the PAT. Mead has the lead right here. Now for Morgan, not to be outdone just yet, would I get this thing going with a 20-yard rush by Braden Fajardo to start this drive and then with 5 minutes 40 seconds left, Briggs Wheatley, he decides to take the ball for himself, run it on a keeper, he gets stuffed on second, this would actually bring up a third and seven, and then Frank Ortega on a nice little out route would make it a fourth and one, coming up just short of that first down. Does not matter as Frank Ortega would go ahead and dive and make it a first down with about 4 minutes 36 seconds left in the third round quarter and then as this drive continues Brandon Fajardo he gets another nice reception off a little out route here a nice ball thrown by Briggs Wheatley and this goes for about 10 or so yards getting that first down Briggs would then do a little bit of work here as well he would truck forward for 10 yards making it second and one and then he would eventually get the first down on a, a quarterback dive. And so this Fort Morgan team, they're rolling here. And then around the 2 minute 48 second mark, Frank Ortega, he would go ahead and basically uh, tie this game up with a nice 10 yard rushing touchdown, capping off this perfect drive for Fort Morgan, if I do say so myself. Making it 14 to 14, a tie game with about 2 minutes left, 3 minutes left in the third quarter. A great response, a response you needed, honestly from Fort Morgan here in the third quarter to go ahead and make this one tied. Now meet, they get the ball, they are running it, third and one, you know what they do, they hand it off to Evan Morris on a dive, he thrashes Ford, not only for the first down, but for about 15 yards actually, and so there you go there. And then another third down and three situation here, with about 20 seconds left, Corby Teku, you already know what it is. They dive with him, and they go ahead and get that first down here. That would end the third quarter. Now, to start the fourth quarter, there would be a holding call called on Mead. That would make it second and 20. And then with about 10 minutes, 33 seconds, uh, Mead would actually use their second timeout of the half to stop another delay of game. So there you go. Um, they would call this timeout and they would go and game plan on what they want to do next here. And so Corby Teku handed off to him. He bounces it outside, makes it a little bit more manageable third and 13 situation, you know. So going from 2nd and 20 to 3rd and 13, not too bad here. And then with 9 minutes 50 seconds left, there is another key pass interference call on 3rd that basically gives me the first down in the red zone here. In the red zone for Morgan's defense, you know, they make some big plays here. And so it becomes 3rd and 7 after a really nice um, tackle for loss from number 68 on Fort Morgan's squad. You know, and so Meade, I mean, they're just trying to run this ball here, use as much clock as possible, make more manageable 3rd and 4th situations. So they run it uh, on a misdirection with Corby Teku here, but he is kind of weeded out here. Does get about three yards, but it is only fourth and four 
here. Now, Meade here would actually call their last time out of the game on fourth down to avoid yet another delay here. And so, at this point, actually, Meade used almost... So, out of the six timeouts they have all game, three in each half, they've used four timeouts just to stop a delay that's kind of a big deal, you know? So just remember that as we continue on in this game. Mead has used four of their six timeouts, including this last one here, to avoid a delay of game. And so here's what happens, you know, Mead, they decide to kick another field goal. They're a little bit closer here, and they do make it, and that would make it a 17-14 to 14 lead. Uh, Mead taking over with about mm, 7 minutes, 40 seconds left in this championship game now with six minutes 47 seconds left for morgan they have the ball they're driving it is third and four briggs wheatley he rolls out he is tripped up for a loss that would make it fourth and five here and this is when the mead crowd starts getting really loud here um in my opinion i thought this might have been low-key maybe the play of the game or the drive of the game here you know they're getting loud like this me team they had like a whole student section the biggest student section i've ever seen for a state championship game they had their band there they had obviously you know all the parents and people who supported them this was a packed crowd and they were super loud so loud that ford morgan would actually have to call a timeout here because it kind of felt like they couldn't I, I don't know, they couldn't hear, like, the plays from the sideline or whatever, or they couldn't figure it out, and so Ford Morgan, go ahead, they call a timeout here, not only so that they could talk about it, but to also prevent a potential delay of game, so there you go there, Ford Morgan, they do call a timeout, um, and they come back, fourth and five here. But this Mead crowd, once again, is fired up. You know, they are yelling, hollering, whatever. And they would force a second straight timeout called. No play has been run yet. So two timeouts are called in a row here by Fort Morgan so that they could go ahead and talk about it one more time here as this crowd was going crazy at this point, you know, because they're, I mean, they're waiting for a big play here for Mead here. And so, you know, this crowd is getting wild here uh, in, in Pueblo in the state championship game with just about five minutes six minutes left in this game so right off the bat you know two straight timeouts called by fort morgan here with five minutes to go here does not matter as briggs wheatley as composed as ever finds his guy Braden fajardo on a nice little out route Braden would go ahead and get that first down converting on fourth down this would calm down the crowd and it would actually be it would still actually be a game changing play here because it would kind of take the crowd out of this situation just a little bit more here by making the perfect play here great throw by briggs you know obviously great job by fajardo going ahead and running it for that first down there and so absolutely huge for fort morgan it keeps their drive alive and their championship hopes alive for now and so fort morgan they're driving Braden fajardo comes a big again with another 10 plus yard uh reception here going for the first down this fort morgan team they're going now and then briggs wheatley he passes for a first down on third and seven fort morgan is now in the red zone after three big pass plays obviously not the biggest pass plays yardage wise but in terms of momentum and in terms of building a drive to win this game absolutely huge this is where i mean this is where legends are made honestly by playing composed football here on the biggest stage on the 3a level and so here we go it is first down four for Morgan with a chance to take this lead and potentially win this game. That's what we're talking about right here. You know, they have to score a touchdown here. A field goal would tie it up, but I don't know how comfortable you would feel with Meade, you know, having the ball with about four minutes left and it's a tied game. And so for Morgan, they want to win the championship. And so they go for it right here. Briggs Wheatley on first down. They call quarterback dive. He dives for it for about five or so yards and then reaches out and he gets the touchdown. 4-4 Morgan and they would hit the field goal hit the PAT making it 21 to 17 for Morgan in the driver's seat here in the championship game a fantastic drive by this Fort Morgan offense led by their quarterback Briggs Wheatley and so you got to think at this point you know Meade they're not exactly panicking yet 
They have three minutes left, no timeouts, thanks to, you know, two of those uh, timeouts going to prevent delay of games. So just keep that in mind. But Meade still has three minutes here to go ahead and score. Now, this touchdown, when you really think about it, it puts pressure on Meade to score a touchdown because obviously a field goal, you know, that wouldn't even tie it. So they need a touchdown here to win this game. That's what it's going to come down to. Anything less is not going to be enough and so here we go with three minutes 12 seconds left you know me they're driving gavin uh garrettson he would go ahead and scramble around this would be a pass play nobody's open this fort morgan defense is locking up and so he would scramble making it third and four here but they would call an illegal shift on Meade, and so it would actually be third and nine instead now gavin garrettson he would run and make it fourth and two this is with about 2 minutes 23 seconds left. And then Evan Morrissey would go ahead and get another 4th down conversion on a dive play, making it 1st down. Now, you know, Meade, they're not moving as fast as they probably should be. You know, this Meade team really isn't a passing team. They're a running team. And so they are running the ball. And so they are kind of, they're in a tough spot here. But Gavin Garrettson, he does find Corby Take, who, who catches it and makes it uh, first down av after, a, I would say, a 10-yard reception just about roughly here. At this point, Meade is going hurry up. There is about, about a minute left in this football game here. Meade still has the ball with a chance to win this game. And then here's what would happen. They would call a run play. I want to say it was either a run play or it was some type of swing pass here. Regardless, the runner got outside. I couldn't quite see who the runner was. But he had a nice little run. It would have went for a first down because um, it was 10 plus yards. But here's where the refs come in. They would call... A uh, legal blindside block, and this would actually make it first and 19 for Meade. Now, gonna be honest, I can't see where the block. I mean, I could see where the penalty is coming from. I could see where the refs are coming from with that penalty, but at the time, it definitely felt a little ticky tacky. I'm just gonna be completely real. I don't know how many refs would make that same call in that moment in state. I just feel like. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just going to leave that right there. I felt like it was maybe not the best call there. But regardless, it's still first and 19. Meade would, though, continue to shoot themselves in the foot. They would have a false start here, making it first and even longer. And then Gavin Garrettson trying to keep this game alive. You know, he throws it towards the sideline, hoping Corby Teku could, you know just out muscle the guy there but number 22 sanchez for fort morgan would get an excellent sideline interception that would essentially end this game fort morgan is your 3a state champions winning 21 to 17 now let me talk about Meade. first off this was Meade's first ever state championship game gotta give him credit man i mean they they battled to get here, you know. They have had a lot of talent over the course of the last couple years and whatnot. They've come close here and there. But for them to make it to state, that was huge. Unfortunately, in state, you know, some of those jitters definitely showed here. Um, like I said, four timeouts all called just to prevent the delay of game. Not even to re-talk a play. Like, at least I don't think so because they would pretty much almost always get those conversions when it was like fourth and short short third and short but four timeouts to call those delays uh total in a game that is i mean that hasn't happened in any state championship game here in colorado um at least this year you know and that proved to be big i'm sure Meade they could have used some of those timeouts you know with those three minutes left uh driving on that last drive there, especially after those penalties. A timeout would have helped to calm down this crew a little bit here and figure out, you know, like what they got to do next, call sets of plays here. But like I said, four timeouts, that's big. You have that missed field goal there. Um, maybe I would have went for it. I, if I was me, I would have went for it, but I definitely understand the situation, um, you know, in at that moment right there and why they did it. But that would come back and hurt them. And then, you know, obviously these penalties, you know, Meade, um, they had a couple penalties go, though, 
go their way, especially on those pass interference calls. But those last penalties at the end there, um, that, I mean, that's a big deal. You know, and so Mead, you know, they played a good game. They played great defense against Briggs Wheatley, I would say. You know, they're getting after him. And they were shutting down this Fort Morgan run for the most part. They did allow a couple runs here and there. But for the most part, you know, they were dominating at the line of scrimmage here. But unfortunately, they came up short. It happens. I think Mead, they'll be back soon. Maybe not immediately next year. But they have a great talent pool. I think they'll be back. They played a heck of a championship game. Uh, so I just got to give them their credit there. But let me talk about Fort Morgan. Your 3A 2021 champions. Fort Morgan, you know, I would have to say on offense, they impressed me. You know, Briggs Wheatley, for the most part, played a very, very clean game. Now, there were a couple of times, you know, his passes were tipped at the line. But, you know, that's more of a testament to the pressure that Meade was getting on Fort Morgan. Uh, I'm not going to blame him for that. But I'm going to give him credit for that last drive here for Fort Morgan. When this crowd was going crazy, you know, and in, in the championship, by the way, you needed to convert here. You know, Briggs came through and then he did it over and over again on that last drive here to set for Morgan up for this last touchdown here that he would get himself, by the way. Briggs Wheatley put together a legendary drive on that final Fort Morgan drive for them. I just got to say, it, you know, looking composed finding his receivers, and then ending it with that run where he stretched out for it. If he didn't stretch out for it, I'm sure the refs would have called him down at the one, but he stretched out for it, got that touchdown, and that is absolutely huge. And then Briggs Wheatley as well, you know, obviously it just wasn't him, but he did have that big defensive play where he tackled Sean Medlock for a loss. Um, that would actually be huge because, you know, Briggs, even though he would get hurt and come out at that point on that drive, you know, that would force a second and long for Meade. And that's when they would actually settle for that field goal that they would miss earlier on in this game and that could have been a momentum changer as well you know going into the half with the lead and so you got to keep all of that in mind this doesn't take away from the team win that for morgan got because frank ortega he was doing his thing as a running back as a receiver we've been known he's a great athlete so he did his thing there uh brayden fajardo the number of times he came up with the first down um especially after that Big time one-handed catch in the first half. That was huge. That flipped the field for Fort Morgan. And even though they wouldn't eventually get the touchdown on the drive, it showed me like, hey, you know, we could still pass it out here. We're still explosive. And obviously, they're there for a reason. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that went on in this game. This defense played well. Especially in the passing game. Obviously, Meade, they're not going to pass the ball a lot. But for the most part, Fort Morgan did a really good job just limiting that, you know. Um, that interception at the end of the game, that was huge. You know, that was just a great play. And so, a lot of things went into this one. But Fort Morgan came out with the dub. They are your 3A state champions. I would say the player of the game for this one, I would have to pick Briggs Wheatley. Even though, even though, I'm just going to throw this out there. They gave it to Frank Ortega. I still think he's very deserving of that. I think Brandon Fajardo, low-key, could have won it as well. I went back and forth between the three of those between, you know, when that game ended and now. But honestly, Briggs Wheatley, he did what he had to do to win this game. And that's all you could ask for out of your quarterback. Do what you gotta do. You know, and he was getting pressure a lot throughout this game. He was getting hammered, whether it was when he was running the ball or whether when he was trying to escape the pass rush and, you know, just find somebody open here. And in the fourth quarter, making those uh, passes, uh, which were mostly out routes, really, and there were good balls on out routes, and that's not the easiest route to throw. Um, especially when you're feeling some pressure too. You got to throw it pretty well or it could go either way. It could be a turnover or it could fall to the ground, but you got to throw it well. And so Briggs Wheatley did his thing, led this team like he has all season. And for that reason, Fort Morgan is your 3A state champs and Briggs Wheatley is your player of the game and probably your 3A player of the week. So, so yeah, there you go. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Playmakers Corner Podcast. Thank you to our co-host Coach V 
for traveling down to CSU Pueblo and recapping the 3A football game. That sounded like a heck of a game and quite the exciting matchup. Meanwhile, while he was down in Pueblo, Mason Austin and I ventured up to Empower Field at Mile High to watch the 4A and 5A state games. And so, a little bit of background here. You had the Chatfield Chargers facing off against the Erie Tigers in the 4A game. And Chatfield here, you know, they were a proven team through and through this year. And they had a pretty tough schedule, honestly. You know, they started off with a win over Longmont, who is a playoff team, and they beat them 49-43. to Longmont obviously being led by their senior quarterback and receivers there, forming one of the best aerial attacks, not only in Colorado, but in the country. So to outshoot them and to outgun them in a game is impressive in and of itself. They then beat Brighton in a non-league game, who is another playoff team. They lost to Fruita Monument in the opening round, but they beat Brighton 43 to 20. And then they beat Fountain Fort Carson 23 to 14. And this was another playoff team, one that actually had a bye heading into these playoffs and were the eighth seed in the bracket itself and beat up on, you know, one of the league teams that Chatfield faced. And, you know, that, that was another tough team. And then they faced uh, Fruita Monument after that and won 28 to seven. Once again, Fruita Monument being another playoff team. I think that there was only two teams on their entire schedule that weren't playoff teams in the regular season, which is absurd. And, you know, they proved it then and continued to, but anyways, they then, the week after that, they experienced their first loss against Pine Creek. This was a very talented squad. You know, they were playing with JoJo Roy, and this game was also in Colorado Springs, which is important to keep in mind for the future. They lost this game 28-22. to Not a bad loss to, you know, this was a quality team that I believe had the, I want to say the three or four seed or something like that in these playoffs, maybe even two. They were a very talented squad and uh, one who faces off against 5A teams all the time. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind. They then beat one of the two non-playoff teams here in Wheat Ridge to start league play, 56-14. And then they got upset by Bear Creek in a stunning 14-10 loss. This was the lowest amount of points that Chatfield scored all season long and was, you know, definitely... A shocker to everyone around the state us included here at playmakers corner and we didn't really know what to make of this game but you know chatfield they they didn't want to freak anyone out and so the next week they outshoot another phenomenal offense in golden led by giselle riley they beat that team 50 to 49 you know completing a uh, two point instead of going for one to sneak out a lead from golden then they faced the only other non-playoff team in, you know, their entire schedule, which was Stanley Lake. They took care of business 45 to 22 before Friday, the 29th, they faced off against Dakota Ridge High School. These guys were actually the number two seed and they went undefeated in this season, including a win over Chatfield, beating them 29 to 28 Chatfield on the regular season, you know. They finish eight and three, I believe is what that adds up to, or seven and three actually. So, you know, they head into the playoffs and they start off with another Colorado Springs team here and they beat Ponderosa very convincingly 31 to nine. And then they get a rematch against Dakota Ridge. And this time it goes way more in their favor. You know, they came back from behind in this game against Dakota Ridge. You know, Dakota Ridge, I believe even at one point had a 21 point lead or something to the tune of that heading into that fourth quarter before Chatfield scored 21 points in the fourth quarter and upset this favored Dakota Ridge team, winning that game 42 to 31 and thus putting them in a spot in the semifinals in another rematch against the Pine Creek Eagles. And this was a great game and another one that Chatfield was actually trailing at halftime. They were down 21 to 14. And, you know, this Pine Creek team looked like the, the Pine Creek team of old. And, you know, they were riding the shoulders of Zion Hill, who almost ran for 200 yards. But that was not to be outdone by this Chatfield backfield that also had 234 yards of, you know, themselves. And they went on to shut out Pine Creek in the second half of this game. 
and score 14 unanswered points to give them a ticket to the state playoff game against Erie. Now, talking about the Erie Tigers team, this was a team that, you know, I have coached against before, and so I was expecting great things out of them this season, and they delivered with an undefeated regular season. Now, there was some mild concern that they were not properly tested during the regular season. They beat a very bad Hinkley team 64 to 14 to start the year. They beat, you know, I mean, it was still a playoff team, but it was a 3A playoff team in Pueblo East, beating them 29 to 7. They then beat their second and third playoff teams and fourth playoff teams, I guess, in a row. But these were some lower seeded guys. You know, they beat Bear Creek 39 to 21. They then destroyed Longmont, who I don't think had Keegan Patterson 50 to 6. And then for their last non league game, played against Skyline and beat them 49 to 0 before heading into a fairly you know, competitive league here in Colorado on the 4A level where they beat Silver Creek 51 to 21. I had the pleasure of meeting this player from Silver Creek who was at the game, actually. He was a really pleasant guy. And, uh, you know, he he was familiar with what this Erie team was about, you know, and I think that score reflects that. And then, you know, they beat up on Brighton 47 to 27. They beat Greeley West for the second year in a row, 46 to 7. And then they have a big game against Cole Crew and the Eagles, who they beat 49 to 21, and then ended the regular season against another playoff team in Windsor, 41 to zero. So, you know, they beat a lot of playoff teams, much like Chatfield did. However, the win percentage of these teams was a lot lower. So there were some questions. There's even, I believe some of the Ears players told me that they were not favored against Fruita Monument, which I thought was blasphemous in the pre-postseason brackets that we all did at Playmakers Corner, I actually had Erie making it to the state championship. And that's how much faith I had against this left side of the bracket. And, you know, they proved me right, obviously, if I'm talking about them right now. And it started off with a big win, 50-26 to 26 over Fruita Monument, before having to travel down to Palmer Ridge and face off against the Grizzlies who, you know, were in the 4A state title game last year and were 3A state champs the year before. So they have a winning culture and program there. And, you know, this Erie defense forced a lot of opportunistic turnovers against this Palmer Ridge offense. And, you know, the Erie offense was getting it done in this Palmer Ridge game. You know, Blake Barnett, I believe he had like three touchdowns in that game or, you know, something like that. Caleb Dyson has been dicing it up all year so you know he was doing his thing and i watched the stream of that game and it was a very good game then you know they get to face off against the number one seed in all of 4a and that was montrose who had an undefeated season so this was easily their biggest test of the entire season and you know i believe it was another game that they weren't favored to win oddly enough and so you know, and heading into the final five minutes of this game, it definitely looked like that. They were down to Montrose 28 to 14 with four minutes to play before, you know, getting a quick touchdown and converting on an onside kick in one of the most unlikely plays of all of football. They recover an onside kick down 21 to 28. They drive down the field and they score a touchdown and then down 27 to 28, Erie, they go for two. They go for the win here. The coach was even quoted as saying, I don't think, I didn't think that Montrose could, you know, I don't think that we could stop Montrose and I respect the honesty of that coach. And, you know, I think he's a really good guy who accomplished a lot here at his first year in Erie. But anyways, you know, they go for two, they convert and they end up winning this game by one point and holding off and stopping this Montrose team from being able to score a touchdown or kick a field goal and advance to the state championship game. And so now that we're at the state title game between Erie and Chatfield, before we jump into it, I just want to shout out some players on both sides. On the Chatfield side, you know, these, this team got here with a plethora of athletes and winning up front. They ran slash do run a wildcat running system led by Jake Marshall, who is one of the top leaders in rushing yards in the state, being, you know, it a quarterback of sorts but mainly just a wildcat quarterback if that makes sense running the ball the majority of the time the guy who would pass would be a sophomore jake jones 
in limited exposure this year you know he found varying degrees of success and failure and then you know they also have two great athletes in the junior mason low who is explosive and uses quick cuts i actually did a breakdown on him last year as a sophomore and was very impressed by him and thought that he took a huge step forward this year as a junior then you had a freshman in brock narva who is definitely one of our candidates for newcomer of the year he was electric in you know this state game as well as a lot of other games this year and then they also saw contributions from you know their defense they had number 70 who was present at media day i believe or no no no, not at media day but number 70 was a force in the middle for sure for this chatfield team that is jackson mccullough i want to say and you know then they also had sam Ayers here who's number 58 he's a junior and they were getting some contributions out of him as well and you know they rode a, a dominant d line as well as some dogs on the offensive side of the ball towards you know a very successful regular and playoff season all of these guys made varying plays throughout the entire playoffs to to get them here then for erie here it's you can't talk about erie without talking about their sophomore quarterback blake barnett he has been electrifying all year he's one of the state leaders in touchdowns between passing and rushing combined and he did a lot of the same this game then you also had a great running back there the second year in a row that they've had a phenomenally athletic running back in caleb tyson or thyson and you know i saw got to meet him at media day very pleasant young man very polite and he was very excited for this opportunity he's been playing with those eerie guys for a very long time on top of that there was also you know john pastor he's a two or three star tackle for this eerie team he's a senior and you know he played a pretty solid game i want to say against this pretty daunting chatfield front that sent a blitz a lot of the time so obviously you had some guys there and you know on top of that aiden oxiger he was our number three rated senior tight end of this class of 22 he made a lot of plays this game number nine uh jalen clickman was making a lot of plays on offense number 47 carter meek he was making a lot of tackles on that defensive side of the ball so without further ado let's go ahead and talk about this game so to start chatfield got the ball to start this game and you know they get uh a first down you know and then another first down you get jake marshall getting getting a couple of yards number 58 gets four yards brock narva breaks off a 15 yard gain so you know they get quite a few consecutive good runs here another first down on mason lowe's half but then you know they finally get stuffed by you know anthony or you know my bad gavin mackick on erie's side here and so that was the first time that they went backwards and you know for two consecutive plays they went backwards before a three yard run made it fourth and nine and they had to punt the ball to erie and you know this first play blake barnett you know he throws an incompletion and you know they also get a run for loss and it's third and 12 before you know blake barnett does blake barnett things and on that you know he finds number eight who is caden lettuce i believe who is a junior here for this Erie team and that was for 25 yards and a first down it was a great throw and catch and I think that that got Blake Barnett kind of in a rhythm there you know that was a huge confidence booster and so then he finds Oxiger on the next play for eight yards before keeping it himself for a 15 yard gain on the next play and so you know Blake making these plays making these throws it opens up you know some it, it opens up some lanes here for Caleb Thyssen who finds a five yard gain and you know then then is met at the line of scrimmage by number 70 you know that dog for Chatfield and so they're faced with a third and five they do a quarterback keeper for four yards and on fourth and one you know Blake Barnett he lines up as if he's going to do a quarterback sneak but he breaks left and gets the edge and gets a first down before you know on the three yard line handing it off to caleb here who punches it in for a three yard touchdown with 355 left in the first quarter and putting erie up six to nothing because they missed an extra point so chatfield gets the ball back here 
and this drive stalls out you know they go three and out here and they have to punt the ball immediately and Erie starts off on the 48 yard line I believe and it's it Caleb and the Erie Tigers pounce on this opportunity with a 27 yard run on the first play and two plays later you know Blake Barnett finds number four I believe and or yeah he finds number four for Erie here that's Gage Nichols and you know this almost was an interception you know it bounced off of Nichols right into the defender's hands and he just wasn't quite ready for the ball to bounce back to him so it bounces back off the Chatfield player and into Nichols hands to give a 13 to 0 lead for Erie in the first quarter now if you're anybody who hasn't been paying attention to Chatfield, there are some guys in the box with us who are thinking, oh no, this is going to be a blowout. Uh, Chatfield doesn't have the pass game to keep up. And I said, just wait. Chatfield's been down basically at every point this postseason against great teams. Don't count them out yet. They have too many athletes. And, you know, what do you know? It's like we here at the Playmakers Corner watch football and we know things and pay attention to storylines because that's exactly what happened, you know. They get some breaks here. You know, they start with the ball on the 39 yard line and immediately get, you know, a, an 11 yard run, six yard run, six yard run, 15 yard run. And by the end of the first, you know, Erie is still up three to nothing, 13 to nothing, but Chatfield is driving very hard here. And so, you know, Jake Marshall, he takes it himself for a four yard gain to start this second quarter and he gets nailed by number 87 here that is Derek Hall he's a junior for this Erie team but that was not enough to discourage this Chatfield team as number 58 Sam Ayers he takes a direct snap up the middle in a wedge kind of run for a 16 yard touchdown to close the gap 13 to 7 and so Erie gets the ball back and this offense that had been schmoovin for the majority of this game you know, they're ready to respond themselves. And on on this drive, they end up in a third and eight situation. And, you know, for a lot of other teams, this is kind of a scary situation. But for Blake Barnett and company, they gain 12 and get a first down. And then, you know, on the next play, Blake Barnett, he gets a bad snap, but still finds a way to gain seven yards here, setting him up for second and three. But on the very next play, he makes a kind of sophomore level mistake as he, you know, kind of buys some, times, buys some time, but then he jumps a little bit when he throws this ball and it just takes enough velocity off of it for Mason Lowe to make an incredibly athletic play and intercept the ball. And this is where momentum takes kind of a huge swing here in this game because on this interception, Mason Lowe brings it all the way to the 22 yard line which is just a heads up play, super athletic play. Mason Lowe is an absolute dog and proved his worth in this game with this massive interception and taking it back to the 22, setting Chatfield up where they wanna be. And at first it looks like this interception might be in vain. They end up with a third and five situation. They have to use a timeout. They only get a two yard gain and are on fourth and three before Brock Narva gets the ball and gets a four yard run and converts on fourth and three for a first down. And on the next play following the fourth down conversion, number 58 clocks in again, Sam airs for an 11 yard run and Chaffield hits the extra point attempt to go up 14 to 13. So Erie gets the ball and you know, they, they get it to the 20 yard line. They get a two yard gain from Caleb. They get a six yard reception out of Aiden set up a third and two and then they get a 30 yard gain from Blake Barnett here and that sets them up on the 43 yard line going in which is all of the room that Caleb needed here as he breaks off a 43 yard touchdown run to put Erie back up 20 to 14 with just under five minutes left in the half and so you know Chatfield not wanting to lose the momentum that they have they get the ball in the 20 yard line and Jake Marshall does what he's done all year and he breaks off the longest run i believe that chatfield had all game 
with a 49 yard run setting him up on the other side of midfield and from there it was all good times as they get a 13 yard gain out of brock narva an eight yard gain out of sam Ayers on that direct snap again then mason Lowe picks up two jake marshall gets a four yard gain setting up second and goal on the five yard line and he punches it in in himself on the next play putting chatfield back up 21 to 20. and so we're getting ready to head into the half here and you know erie wants to score they get the ball back to start the second half and so they come out ambitious and they come out swinging they get a five yard gain before getting an incompletion here and then on third and five they have another incompletion making it fourth and five here and they get a bad snap on the punt and i don't know what the punter was doing but he didn't get the ball off it had a penalty added on to it and so chatfield gets the ball inside the 10 yard line on the seven and that is all the room that they need because you know they get a six yard gain on the first play and on the very next play jake marshall cashes it in and for his second consecutive touchdown of the game and you know puts chatfield up 28 to 20 with a minute and a half left in the first half of this game so erie with the ball back and a minute and a half left they want to recapture their hot start to the beginning of this half and you know they get a return to the 35 yard line then they pick up 11 yards on a pass from blake barnett to jalen klickna who is a senior then there's an incomplete pass, but I definitely think that number 16 should have caught this ball. He just stopped moving after waving for it. It was a little high, but it did hit him in the hands. But that was no worries because Blake, he finds, you know, a hole to run in and he gets 20 yards on a keeper before finding number four, Gage Nichols again on a nine yard gain. It is second and one and they take a timeout here. They get a quarterback keeper to convert on a first down with just under a minute left in the half. But Blake Barnett misses his guy on this next throw. And Brock Narva, the freshman, steps up and makes a heads-up play to intercept Erie and kill this drive that was at least inside the 30-yard line, maybe even inside the red zone, and allows Chatfield to take a knee and take a lead to halftime up 28-20. to So Erie... They start with the ball here in this second half, but some things to consider from this first half and some stats to look at is obviously the red zone conversion has something to do with it as Erie goes two for three and Chatfield goes four for four in the red zone and, you know, proving that that lead there while Erie only goes two for three. Then you also have Chatfield's passing game is completely absent. They went 0 for 2 to start this to start this first half. And so, but one advantage of not passing the ball for them is that they did not throw an interception. And that was the biggest story, I think, of this half is that, you know, Erie, they turned the ball over twice in this first half, both on interceptions of Blake Barnett. And this doesn't even include the muffed punt. So a lot of really costly mistakes in this second quarter on Erie's part that allows Chatfield to score 28 points in this second quarter and take a lead heading into halftime. And some of the guys that obviously capitalize here for Chatfield includes, you know, Mason Lowe and Brock Narva on those interceptions. Those were absolutely massive, you know, being a part of those two turnovers there. And Brock Narva also led this team in tackles heading into half with six tackles on the day and notched on another 24 yards on the ground. Jake Marshall was having a heck of a half here, you know, going 15 rushes for 110 yards, obviously slightly skewed by that 49 yard run in, you know, to start that drive, but still impressive nonetheless. And then Sam Ayers with his two touchdowns to end the half here was very massive as for Erie like I said those two interceptions by Blake were very costly but he did somewhat make up for it by having over a hundred yards of rushing in this first half capped by a long of 30 and then you also had Caleb who had eight rushes as well for 77 yards and two scores one being that three yard punch and the other one being that 43 yard rip that he did have 
On the defensive side of the ball, they were led by 37 CJ Reeves and 55 Ryan McConnell with seven tackles a piece. And they went into half with two tackles for loss on the defensive side of the ball. Obviously, they were clamping very early in this game. And, you know, honestly, this first half went by super fast just because both these teams ran the ball really well and broke off some very long drives here and long plays. So that was very interesting to take note of. But we're going to jump in here into the second half of this game. And yeah, let's just jump into it. So Erie, they get the ball started on the 20. And they start off with two consecutive seven-yard gains on runs by Caleb and Blake, respectively. Then Blake gets ready to rip off this really long gain, but he is stopped by number 10, Caden Logan. He is a very good linebacker over there at Chatfield. So he makes a great heads-up play. Then they get a six-yard run. Erie does on, or a six-yard gain on second down, and it sets up third and one. And, you know, they they get the first down here. Uh, Erie does. But, you know, they continue to drive. They cough it up. But number 55 for Erie recovers it. And they're just chipping away. You know, they get gains of six, two, four, three. And uh, eventually find themselves at a third and four before, you know, Blake Barnett finds a familiar name in Jalen Klickna for a first down here to you know a gain of 12 even then they get a few more gains and they face a you know fourth and one inside of the 10 or inside the 15 yard line and so they Erie knows what they want to do they want Blake Barnett to keep it and so it's a direct snap QB run and you know against a lot of other teams I think this works and Blake Barnett, I think he took a little too long trying to find a hole when really he probably should have just went straight forward for a first down. But regardless, it was a massive heads up play by Brock Narva who stuffs Blake Barnett inches short of the first down. You know, Blake even lowered his shoulder and I think he popped Brock Narva pretty good. But Brock, he's aid strong. He didn't get completely ran over. He stopped the play here and made a massive tackle against one of the best players in the state. So a freshman beats out a sophomore for this play and Chatfield gets the ball on the 10 yard line to start this drive. And so they pick up a couple of first downs and then a face mask on Erie helps Chatfield move the chains here. And they followed up with a three yard run by Jake, an eight yard run by Jake, an 18 yard run by Brock Narva. Then Jake with another seven yard gain. Brock Narva gets a four-yard gain on a reverse. They force an encroachment on Erie, so they are just chipping away at this Erie defense. And this drive actually eats up the entire third, the rest of the third quarter. And they start the fourth quarter with a third and one, up still 28 to 20. So a scoreless third quarter in one of the highest scoring games of two teams combined this year in Colorado football but a very surprising two possession quarter there in the third. And so coming out, like I said, they have that third and one and they get a four yard gain out of Jake Marshall that converts and gets them the first down. They then get a two yard gain out of Mason Lowe and they are second and goal. And number five keeps it himself and gets blasted honestly by number 77. That is Logan Gilmore. He's a junior on that Erie squad. And, you know, it's setting up third and goal. Chatfield even takes a timeout here with 10 minutes and four seconds left in the game to talk things over on this third and four here. And, you know, that's all right because number 20, once again, this freshman doing it for, doing it all for Chatfield here. He gets a four yard touchdown run and Chatfield misses the extra point, but still. Good, making it a 34 to 20 game is massive for Chatfield here. And so Erie on the next drive, they get the ball on the 17 and they come out and they want to, you know, show that they're still alive and they're in this game. So they get a nine yard gain with a fine to, you know, number five here, Caleb, he picks up nine yards. Then Blake finds number nine for an 11 yard gain. Then he finds Aiden Oxiger for an 11-yard gain. Then he finds a third different receiver in a row here 
with number eight, Caden here catching a 12 yard gain. And so Chatfield, they take a timeout because this is just a huge momentum swing for this, for this Erie team and Chatfield, they need to take a breather. They want to come out and, you know, push them back the other way. And it kind of works, I think, because number 70 gets a huge stop here on number five, stuffing them at the line of scrimmage. And then there is a holding penalty on one of the guards for Erie that brings back a miraculous Blake Barnett scramble that would have been a touchdown. And so it sets up a second and 20 and eventually a third and 20 here. But Blake Barnett, he weaves, he manipulates the pocket really well, and he finds a, an open number nine once again here, Jalen Klickna, who gets all the way to the 21-yard line. But something to note here is that this was not a first down play. This was, you were looking at a fourth and one with where the play actually ended up. I watched the replay. There is a, a consensus in the booth and between Mason and I that it was a very bad spot. But number nine, I mean, I gotta give some credit here where credit's due and being creative. He spotted the ball himself on the 20 yard line and the reps rolled with it and marked it a first down. This proved to be kind of a massive play here because they would eventually score on this drive with a one yard touchdown run by Caleb to make it 34 to 27 with 552 left in the game. So Chatfield, they want to put Erie out of this game. They want to break them down. And so they start with the ball on the 20 yard line and they get a two yard run and a one yard run and they get a third and seven. And so they dial up a run to number five, Jake Marshall here. He's been their guy all game. But it's actually Erie who steps up here. And number 22, Jace Omnistad, I believe is how you say that, or Omnisteed, he makes a play here in the backfield, actually, and forces a fourth down. And Chaffield has to punt the ball to Erie, who gets the ball on the 45-yard line. And so, you know, they get a one-yard gain here on first down. Then they get a five-yard gain. And then there's an incompletion, number 14, actually, for Chatfield. That is Gus Shelp, I believe, is how you say that. He's a sophomore. He breaks up the pass and forces a fourth and four. And Erie continues to shoot themselves in the foot with penalties here. And they have an illegal motion. I am slightly questioning of the call here, but it sets up a fourth and nine nonetheless. And Blake Barnett, he lays it all on the line. He scrambles, dips, dives, and he leaps over a defender you know, it reminds me kind of of the helicopter kind of dive that John Elway did. It's only appropriate that it's here in Mile High. And he does that to get a first down on fourth and nine and keep Erie's chances alive. He then finds, once again, number nine here for a 12-yard gain. And then Caleb picks up five yards. And Erie calls a timeout here. They commit a false start. It looks like they're going to continue to shoot themselves in the foot. However, this was not the case as Blake Barnett puts his faith in Aiden Oxiger, who mosses the defender for the, a massive touchdown here to tie the game up at 34. I cannot tell you how hype I was. I kept repeating, yeah, that's the number three tight end right there. That's why he's number three on our list. He makes big plays. He makes big plays. He makes big catches. He's a big boy, and that's a big boy play, and that's exactly what happened here to tie this game up at 34. And so Chatfield here, you know, they they want to end this game. They Neither of these teams want to dance with the other team in overtime. These teams are so dangerous in the red zone. And so Chatfield, they get the ball here. And they're not necessarily built for a two-minute kind of drill being a running team is what a lot of people would think. However, with the explosive athletes that they have, they find a way here. And so, you know, it starts off bad. It starts off bad. There's a messed up snap. And number five got tackled in the backfield. Then Jake Jones, you know, he finds a four-yard gain. And it's third and six here. And Erie calls a controversial timeout. Obviously, Erie wants to get the ball. They also don't want to go to overtime. And they think third and six, they should be able to get a stop here. But Jake Marshall does what he has been doing all game. And he moves the chains here and finds a way to make it first down. And then the craziest play and one of the craziest things I have ever seen in my entire life happens here. 
They got number 13, Jake Jones, back there. There's just over a minute left in this game. And he throws the ball to Mason Lowe here, who's running a hitch. And Mason Lowe, instead of catching it and pitching it for a hook and ladder, he volleyball sets this ball back to Brock Narva, who gains 23 yards on this play and moves Chatfield on the other side of the field. They then get a 12-yard gain out of Mason Lowe, once again, stepping up here before getting stuffed on the very next play here on first down. Number 20, Brock Narva got stuffed. And so Chatfield takes a timeout here, and there is about 16 seconds left in this game. And they line up in shotgun. Jake Jones, the sophomore quarterback. This team, both these teams are very young. And so that makes me very excited for the future. But he steps back and he lobs this ball to number 27, Drew Coleman. And on only their fourth pass attempt of the entire game, they throw a touchdown. It was a 28-yard score, putting Chatfield up 41 to 34 with 11 seconds left in the game. This was an electrifying throw. The box was going crazy. The stance were going crazy. Chatfield and Erie both showed up very well in numbers, I should say, by the way. So shout out to both those fan bases for tuning in and putting on a show for Colorado football. And boy, did the teams deliver here by being entertaining themselves, going down to the wire here and throwing a, their only passing touchdown and only one of four only i mean chatfield only completed two passes all game and they were two of the biggest passes of the game arguably here including this touchdown it was a great throw by jake jones that had just enough lob for drew to get under it and beat the defender and score with a phenomenal you know fingertip kind of grab here that he ended up having to make with the way that the route had to be ran eerie they get the ball in the 37 with six seconds left they you know get a quick completion here to number eight for 11 yards before Blake Barnett bombs it and it is swatted down and Chatfield becomes your 2021 4A state champions and congratulations to Chatfield. I'm going to talk more about Chatfield and the stats of this half in a second but I want to put some respect on Erie's name. They actually outscored Chatfield in this fourth quarter 14 to 13 because of that missed PAT and, you know, they stuck around and they fought very valiantly against this Chatfield team. They played a pretty stout defense to start this game and they forced some big stops when they needed to, you know, to give Erie a chance, especially under five minutes left, getting Blake Barnett the ball back so that him, Caleb, and Aiden could drive down and tie this game. I mean, when I tell you that one of the best catches I've seen all year was Aiden Oxiger going up and catching the ball over this defender's head, it was so clutch on the offense and defense for Erie here. I think that they played a great game. Something to keep in mind here that really sucks for this team is the penalty yards ended up being a massive difference in this game as Erie had 10 penalties for 92 yards, including 67 on offense and 25 on defense. That makes it really hard to win a game here, you know. But they did a great job converting on third down, 7 for 11. Those are great numbers. They converted, for the most part, on fourth, you know, 50% conversion on fourth down. You might want to take a field goal in one of these instances, I think. But, I mean, I can respect them going for it on both of those. But, you know, ugh, it's just, it was tough. It was a tough game and a great opponent in Chatfield who, you know, themselves, they didn't really commit any turnovers and they had monster contributions from a bunch of players but not to take away anything from Erie you know Blake Barnett in his first state game you know he goes 21 of 29 for 250 yards just about two scores and two interceptions and added on another 153 yards on the ground so he did everything he possibly could 400 total scrimmage yards in this game and probably would have been the player of the game if they pulled this out he played great. Then you had Jalen Clicknaught, who caught 100% of his targets, going for 106 yards. Aiden Oxiger, as I talked about, you know, going for 50 yards just about on the day. And that massive touchdown catch. And Gage Nichols catching that circus catch for a touchdown. And, you know, on the defensive side of the ball, CJ Reeves and Derek Hall. Number 87 impressed me this game. And I think he's going to be a dog this next year. As well as, uh, well, Ryan McConnell. He, all of those guys had 10 tackles apiece. Gavin Malik had eight tackles himself, including one and a half for loss. This Erie defense 
played very well. However, this Chatfield team, just as they have all year, they showed perseverance, creativity, and athleticism to win this state game. I'm not sure the last time they won. It might have been with Dave Logan in 2001, but you might want to fact check me there. Regardless, this is massive for this Chatfield program and team who is also very young themselves. And it started with Brock Narva, who had 10 tackles this game and an interception to kill an eerie drive, not to mention his reception for 23 yards here on a improbable hook and ladder to move them on the other side of the field here. And, you know, also he was second on the team with eight carries for 54 yards, as well as a touchdown here, throwing his name in the hat for player of the game. Jake Jones, sophomore quarterback who started the game 0 for 1 on kind of a scary play that was almost an interception in the first half and a Chatfield team that was 0 for 2 to start in the first half in the passing game. He stepped up massively here, delivering a great throw on this hook and ladder with just enough, you know, velocity and timing for it to be batted up by Mason Lowe back to Brock Narva for a big game. And then obviously the game winning touchdown pass out of this sophomore here who, you know, found Drew Rollman. I guess it was a 32 yard catch. And it was just a perfect pass where only Drew can make a play on it after he had beat the defender. And of course, you can't talk about this game without talking about number five, Jake Marshall, one of the state leaders in yards. He had 27 carries for 151 yards and two scores in this game and makes the player of the game a very hard choice to make here and you know something to definitely consider but you know this was a very back and forth game it was one of the most exciting games i've seen all year and left you know all of our all of the fans were definitely you know entertained that we were entertained this was a phenomenal game and so i just want to give both these teams credit where credit is due and congratulate both of them on phenomenal seasons here and with all of this in mind, I want to congratulate both Chatfield and Erie on very successful seasons and then name my playmaker of the game, our 4A playmaker of the week. This was really tough and I do want to give a very, very honorable mention to Jake Marshall who had 27 carries for 151 yards and two touchdowns and the longest play that Chatfield had all game with that 49 yard run. But I am going to give it to Brock Narva, the do-it-all freshman here for Chatfield. 54 rushing yards, a rushing touchdown, 23 receiving yards, and 35 kickoff return yards, making it 108 total yards from scrimmage. But really, his biggest plays came on the defensive side of the ball with a whopping and team-leading 10 tackles, including arguably the biggest tackle of the game, in that one-on-one -on -one situation on fourth and one against Blake Barnett, stopping him for a turnover on downs and, you know, taking away at least six of Erie's points or at least three points on that drive potentially. And also the interception to end the first half. So, you know, you think of like a plus minus, it's a hard thing to measure, but if I'm going to give a plus minus here to Brock Narva, taking away 12 of Erie's points, and also producing six, that's a plus minus of plus 18 points in my eyes. You know, obviously he was on defense when touchdowns were scored and whatnot. However, I do think that he played a phenomenal game in every facet of the game. And he is going to be my 4A Playmaker of the Week. And I'm going to just one more time say congratulations to the Chatfield Chargers. I will say, you know, they proved us and a lot of doubters wrong, but I'm going to put our name in that conversation we all here at Playmakers Corner took Erie to win this game, but we knew it was going to be a tight game. And I will say, you know, in that press box, when they were down 13 to nothing, I was the only one in, in our vicinity who said, hey, do not count these guys out. They've been here before. They know how to do it. And they at least proved me right on that front. I just want to give them, you know, a congratulations on a revenge tour gone well with their wins over Dakota Ridge and Pine Creek being major highlights of this season in general after losing to them previous and then obviously winning the state championship at Empower Field. Huge congratulations to all those guys 
and best of enjoy enjoy it enjoy it. you guys deserve it but coming up next i will recap the 5a state championship for colorado Hello, y'all, and welcome back to the Playmakers Corner podcast. I am your host for this 5A segment, Cody Stoffer. I was accompanied by Mason Austin during these 4A and 5A games and, you know, had a, had a great time. He is a huge part of the reporting here and was actually the play-by-play note taker in our notes. I was in charge of the social media and videos. So shout out to Mason Austin for helping out during this championship Sunday at Empower Field. Once again, thank you to the Denver Broncos to, for hosting the 4 and 5A games. It is very different from watching them at the Thunder Bowl. And, you know, it was a great experience. And thank you to Chassa for the invites. And thank you, Cherry Creek and Valor, for putting on a game for us. And so talking about the tail of the tape here, you know, I'm going to first start off with Cherry Creek. They finished the regular season with a nine and two record, I want to say. No, it was the eight and two record, eight and two record, including a co-tie for the Centennial League. To start the season, they thumped a bad Doherty team. I don't think they won a single game. They beat them 42-0. Then they beat a playoff team, a pretty decent a playoff team that won a game at least, you know, uh, 31 to zero. So they had that going for them. Then they played an out of state game against one of the top 30 teams in the nation against Chandler high school in Arizona. This was a hard game fought by both teams. And Mason Austin was our, you know, spectator for that game. He watched the stream of it and, you know, talked about it on whatever, I think that was the week three or week four recap about, you know, how Christian Hammond looked a little, a little tough this game. You know, he was having some tough decisions to make and the Chandler defense was swarming him. But all in all, you know, a 17 to seven loss definitely kind of humbled this Creek team as, you know, one of their players said when we met up with them, I believe it was Christian Hammond and, you know, kind of set the tone on what it means to play out of state up, you know, competition and just how good they are outside. But they came back vengeful and ready for a dub. Dave Logan helped coach a 52 to 21 win over his former team that he coached back in the 90s against Arvada West. Then they faced off against Regis Jesuit for the first time this season and left with a 34 to 14 win before heading into league play. They had a one, two, three, four, and one record. So then they head into league play and they thrash Cherokee Trail at Cherokee Trail 41 to 10, shutting down one of the you know, highest scoring passing offenses and one of the biggest play passing offenses out there led by Logan Brook and, you know, Jack Pierce, as well as Gage Gordon, the tight end. So, you know, you had some dogs out there. Then they eke out a very close win against Grandview, 21 to 13. This is a hard fought game by both teams and one of the better games of the season here. So, you know, they're 2-0, and they're looking to win the league title. But then at Arapahoe's, stadium littleton public school stadium they get upset by the warriors in a 13 to 10 loss that showed you know what was thought to be some vulnerabilities on this creek team they were overwhelmed by a pass rush that included you know jared ramos jackson adams exodus johnson and a front seven that you know held this creek team to only one touchdown and you know also scored the only touchdown of this creek game you know with a pick six and rapo beats creek 13 to 10 and you know, there's starting to be some doubts. We hadn't seen Creek lose a game all year last year. They won two state championships in a row. And, you know, they have two losses this year. So, you know, some people might start to doubt their ability to compete for a state title here. And, you know, they try and uh, they go on a tear here on the next five games to try and silence those thoughts. And, it includes a 41 to 14 win over Eagle Crest and a 35 to 10 win over Smoky Hill, who was a playoff team, before blanking Mountain Vista in a 34 to zero dominating fashion at home. Then they faced off against Regis Jesuit High School for the second time this season and beat them 28 to seven behind a ground game that consistently moved the chains and a defense that suffocated this Jesuit passing attack and rushing attack. 
before facing off against the three seed Legend Titans who just dispatched the Warriors who had given Creek such troubles earlier. I'll even admit that in the week before this, I was drinking the Legend Titans Kool-Aid and thought that their offense could do something not against this suffocating Creek defense as they went on to beat Legend 48 to 14 and prove that they are just as dominant as the counterparts here, Valor Christian, who went undefeated all the way up into this state game, including against some familiar opponents. You know, you had Regis Jesuit, who they beat 24 to 6. So a dominating win to start the season here for Valor Christian. And then they get back to back out of state or games against out of state opponents is what I should say. And they win against Oaks Christian 30 to 7 on a neutral site in California. And then they beat East Side Catholic, a Washington team, 41 to 0. And Gavin Sawchuk runs rampant in these opening games, having, I'm pretty sure, over 30 carries in each of these games and easily over 100 yards and multiple touchdowns, putting on a strong case for most valuable playmaker on the 5A level. Then they face off against Mullen, come back to Colorado teams in competition, and they beat them 42 to 7. And they lastly finish off against Columbine and win 35 to 21 outrushing them in a home game to close out their non-league schedule with an undefeated season including two wins against out-of-state teams they then take care of business against mountain vista winning 49 to 6 to start league play and dispatch most of their league opponents the same way scoring over 40 against all of their league opponents including over 50 in their home closer beating thunder ridge 52 to 21 beating castleview after vista 47 14 Highlands Ranch 48-6 and Rock Canyon 43-10. Also facing off against four of, you know, four playoff teams on the 5A level. But a little bit different than Centennial League, as we'll come to find out perhaps. But Fort Collins, you know, they host Fort Collins in the opening round and they win 52-2, blowing out the, you know, league winners from the north. Then they get a rematch against Columbine at home here. And they end up winning here this was a much closer game as they only won 17 to 7 and were tied 7 all for a long time in this game before some things started to open up on a drive in the third into the fourth quarter i covered that game in that week's recap it was a pretty exciting game i was very glad to have watched it and you know columbine just didn't have the passing game to keep up with valor and make a comeback at the end then in the semifinals, they face off against the Grandview Wolves and they thump these guys 37 to 6 on the heels of, you know, another vintage Gavin Sawchuck performance that saw him run for 176 yards. They also had a, you know, just suffocating game on the defensive side of the ball, forcing a turnover on Liam Zarka and also, you know, forcing just, uh, you know, a lot of pass breakups and whatnot. So, you know, they rode a suffocating defense to a state title appearance against Cherry Creek here. And this was a rematch of last year and their third meetup in the state title game in the past four years. This was, you know, Valor here was the team who had a lot more returning talent from last year as far as starters go. Creek did graduate 44 kids last year and even Dave Logan in the press conference kind of described it as a transition year so you know you had the one and two seed on the 5a level but valor was looking to rewrite what happened last year and so let's go ahead and dive into the 5a state title game at empower field at mile high so to start this game i believe that valor actually started off with the ball on the 20 yard line and so the very first play of the game you know, they get a 11-yard gain out of Gavin Sawchuck for a first down, and they're immediately on the ball, and they keep running right at this Creek team until, you know, it's third down, and Blake Purchase bats a pass at the line of scrimmage, almost intercepting it and forcing a Valor punt after they had to, after they took a couple of tackles for loss. So Creek, they get the ball, they run, on first and second down but they get kind of stuffed but then you know number one he uh, that's Christian Hammond he keeps the ball himself on this play and you know keeps this play alive and um, 
you know, gains a first down, but it actually had to come back because of a snap infraction on the center. And then number 16 was stuffed by number 21 on Valor. That is Andrew Hale, our number five senior safety. And that brings up fourth and six and a Creek punt. And so with the ball back here, Valor goes right back to what they know and hand the ball off to Gavin Sanchuk, but he gets swallowed up after a one yard gain. And on the next play, Colton Allen, he keeps it himself and gets stuffed by number 23 for this Creek defense. That is Tyler Pell. And then they end up getting stopped on third and nine and end up punting to the Cherry Creek team who starts with the ball on the 45. And so Christian Hammond keeps it himself and picks up a gain of 12. And then he completes a screen pass to number seven, Cooper Pollard. He is a junior wide receiver who gains 11 and gets out of bounds. Then Christian Hammond keeps it himself once again for an 11 yard gain. And they call a timeout with about four minutes and 10 seconds left in the first quarter here. Before, and then on the very next play, right out of the timeout, Christian Hammond finds number 13, Maxwell Rodriguez, the sophomore tight end, for a 21-yard touchdown, putting Creek up 7 to nothing with four minutes and three seconds left in the first quarter. Valor gets a you know, return to the 20 yard, Valor starts at the 20 yard line, I should say, because a lot of these kicks just went through the end zone. And number 66 for Creek here, that is George Fitzpatrick, who was moved to the D line for this game. He bats a pass down, which is, you know, something that could easily happen at a six foot six slash six foot seven frame here for the Ohio State commit. And the next two plays are incompletions, and Valor is going three and out once again and punts to Creek. And so on this next Creek drive, there is a quick pitch to number 17, who gets tackled by the Turf Monster before an incompletion and another tackle for loss. And on fourth and 14, after the Valor defense forces a couple of uh, you know plays in the backfield, Creek then punts going three and out. Then on the next drive, number 27, Gavin Sacha gets found in the backfield by number 12, Blake Purchase. And on the very next play, Blake Purchase tips the ball on a number 19 pass. Colton Allen is having a hard time getting it over this massive six foot five, six foot six sized defensive end outside linebacker here who is wreaking havoc on this entire Valor line. And, you know, on the very next play, number six, Henry Lamar, the inside linebacker, the athletic linebacker, I should say, for Cherry Creek, intercepts Colton Allen and takes it back to the house to give Creek a 14 to nothing lead with one minute and 19 seconds left in the first. So Valor, they get the ball back and Gavin Sacha gets two consecutive carries, getting a net of one yard for those before Colton Allen finds number 26, or no, not number 20. Anyway, he finds a receiver here, thanks Mason, for a 12 yard gain and a first down. And then on the next play, Gavin Sawchuk fumbles. And this fumble is forced by the safety here, you know, Tyler Tolbert. We didn't have a chance to correct that because the game just happened so fast. And, you know, Logan Brantley also got his hand on Gavin Sawchuk here. And it was recovered by number 32, actually, for this Creek team. So, you know, lots of contributors from all over this Creek defense, helping force turnovers, force fumbles, force, you know, interceptions and whatnot, and helping this Creek offense have a lot less field to go. And so, you know, you think Creek, they have a lot of momentum here. They're up 14-0. They have the ball in great field position. But number 90 for this Valor team, Gabe Kirschk, I want to say it, his name is. He stuffs number 17 on the very next play. And then Creek ends up with a delay of game here before Christian Hammond finds um, number 14, Ismail. Here he's a guy getting a lot of college offers right now. And they get pick up five, making it third and 10 here. And they only get one yard on the next play, and it's fourth and nine, and they punt it, and Valor has to start their drive on the 16-yard line. 
Colton Allen drops back in the pocket here and he tucks and runs for a gain of four before, you know, the next play, he picks up another two yards. So he runs back to back plays and forces a third and four for this Creek defense to try and stop. And Gavin Sawchuk rips off a 15 yard gain and a first down here. Valor very quickly gets back on the ball and they try and catch this Creek defense off guard. But Angelo Petritus here, He's a sophomore. He tackles Gavin Sawchuk for only a one yard gain here. Then Colton Allen finds number 12, Colby Reynolds on the next play for a three yard gain. And Gavin Sawchuk picks up two yards to make it fourth and one here. Everyone knows in this stadium where the ball is going to, it's going to the number one rated prospect in the state. Gavin Sawchuk gets the handoff and is stuffed by Cherry Creek and they force a turnover on downs. So on this next drive, Cherry Creek gets into a third and two situation, but then proceed to shoot themselves in the foot a couple of times with a false start that pushes them back to third and seven. And then another penalty, uh, which is a holding and makes it third and 30. And yeah, uh, they end up punting on this drive. And so, you know, the, Valor Christian Eagles are trying to make something happen here. You know, Colton Allen finds Gavin Sawchuck for a pickup of six. Then he finds Grant Simmons, their leading receiver, for a pickup of 12. And it's starting to feel like some momentum can go their way before Gavin Sawchuck only picks up three yards on two consecutive carries, making it third and seven. And so Colton Allen, he once again finds Grant Simmons for an 11-yard gain and another first down moving the chains. Then... Gavin Sawchuk gets stuffed on first down here. Then, you know, they end up in a third and six situation after Colton Allen once again finds Grant Simmons. And they, you know, Colton Allen finds Grant Simmons again on the next play for a pickup of five, making it fourth and inches. Once again, Valor hands the ball off to Gavin Sawchuk, who gets gobbled up by this Cherry Creek team and forced another toner over on downs, making... Valor 0 for 2 on fourth down attempts, handing off the ball short. And so then, you know, Christian Hammond, he takes what the defense gives him a couple plays in a row. You know, he finds number three here, Kai Mir Johnson for a pickup of six. He finds Kai O'Day Jr., you know, for a pickup of six and a first down. But then he pulls some rabbit out of the hat trick stuff. It was one of the best plays, if not the highlight play of the entire game here, scrambling around and avoiding multiple sacks and rolls out left and keeps the play alive and finds number 14 for a 25 yard touchdown reception, putting Creek up 21 to zero with two minutes and 41 seconds left in the half. And so Valor not wanting to be blanked for the second year in a row to start the first half comes out. And they get a nine yard pickup from Gavin here to, you know, set up a second and one before number 32 on the very next play swallows him up in the backfield, making it third and one. And then, you know, Colton Allen gets stuffed at the line here and it forces fourth and one. And so they have another fourth and short and they hand it off to Gavin Sautrick, who converts this time making it a first down and giving Valor their first fourth down conversion of the first half. This then is capped off by a false start on the very next play. And then Colton Allen, he drops back. No one's open and he scrambles for a pickup of nine. Then he finds number 22, Jake Crickler, I want to say, a sophomore for a pickup of six before number nine intercepts Number 19 here for getting Cherry Creek the ball on the 48 yard line. So Creek to start this drive, they get a false start by number 79 before running the ball once and heading into half with a 21 to zero lead. And as far as stats to talk about in the first half, you obviously have to bring up that Creek is winning the turnover margin with a plus three margin after forcing two interceptions, including taking one to the house and also forcing a fumble on the number one recruit in the state. It was his second fumble in the past three weeks in a playoff game that helped kind of turn momentum in a game. So those are the first ones that obviously jump out here. It was pretty even here. You know, Valor 
They they had 78 passing yards compared to Creek's 98 passing yards. So you can be kind of happy about that. And, you know, both these teams were only averaging about three yards per carry. And the longest rush of the first half was a fifth, that 15-yard rush by Gavin Sawchuck pretty early in the game. And Creek, you know, they're committing more penalties, but they're making a lot more plays in the backfield. So, you know, that is something to keep track of here. But I think the biggest stat to look at here is the average drive start. Beller had eight drives, and they their average drive start in this first half was the 16-yard line. So anytime they drove, you know, they would have to drive over 80 or nearly 80 yards, especially on those touchbacks on the Creek kickoffs, you know, always forcing them to start at the 20 yard line, not really getting a chance for a good return. Creek getting three punts inside of the 20 yard line is pretty massive, including some that pinned them even within the 10 yard line. So, you know, that special teams kind of focus on Cherry Creek helps them out significantly in this game, jump out to a 21 to 0 lead. And, you know, their ability to return and field punts and whatnot also helps them start with an average field position of the 43.7 yard line on their seven drives in that first half. And so talking about some impact players, you know, obviously Gavin Sawchuk, he had 62 yards on 20 carries for an average of 3.1 yards per rush. Colton Allen did some things with his legs with four rushes for 15 yards. And in the passing game, you know, Grant Simmons was easily the biggest target for Valor here, catching four passes on seven targets for 51 yards, including a 21-yard touchdown. But, you know, I think that Colton Allen's kind of security blanket towards Grant Simmons because he's one of the only players who gets separation on routes there. You know, I think that that led to some mistakes in the first half for sure. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Jordan Norwood, he had eight tackles, including three for loss. And Andrew Hale also had four tackles being the second leading guy. Not to mention that Carter Forsyth here, number 43, had the other tackle for loss for Valor in this first half. As for the Creek side, obviously impacted the game. Christian Hammond almost being perfect in the first half, going 9 for 10 for 98 yards and two scores, and also picking up five rushes for 16 yards. So over 100 scrimmage yards there. The rest of this Creek team was kind of struggling. Arion Boyd was the biggest leader in yards per rush with five yards per rush on three carries. So not even that much craziness. And then offensively, you know, catching the ball, Ismail was the biggest impact here going three for three on targets and receptions for 47 yards and the touchdown on that 39 yard catch and run where, you know, he just showed great IQ and awareness and moving along with the play and finding a way to get open as Christian Hammond was scrambling around and, you know, making, making an incredible play. Really, he was. He was electrifying on this Saturday evening in Mile High. And then on the defensive side of the ball, you had a lot of contributors here. Blake Purchase was having a massive game. Six tackles, including a half one for loss, including Chase Brackney, who had the exact same stat line. But Blake Purchase had three batted passes in that first half. And it was not the end of his contributions in the pass game. Then you also had Angelo Petritas and Logan Brantley, who had a tackle for loss apiece and five and four tackles respectively. And Tyler Tolbert holding it down in the back end with four tackles. So lots of huge contributions here. George Fitzpatrick moving over to the defensive side of the ball, getting that batted pass earlier and also a single tackle. So heading into the second half of this game, obviously Creek gets the ball to start, but they immediately commit a block in the back on the return and start on the 13 yard line and you know they end up going three and out here especially because number 47 luke meyer i believe he's a three-star edge rusher here he sacks christian hammond for a loss of 11 and forces a creek punt and valor gets some of the best starting field position they've had all day by getting it on the 40 yard line following a decent return and so you know it starts off the way Valor wants to reestablish who they've been all year, and they get a six-yard run out of Gavin Sawchuk before on the next play he is tackled for loss by Blake Purchase. And then Blake Purchase follows it up with another big-time play by intercepting Colton Allen and taking it all the way to the seven-yard line on a massive return. It was a great coverage play and a very athletic play by one of the best players in the state, regardless of class in Blake Purchase. 
Creek does get penalized here for a sideline interference call. You know, they're just excited over there. They're they're feeling the vibes. They're definitely feeling like they're going to win state for the sec for the third year in a row, which is a very rare feat. And I don't think it had been accomplished since Christian McCaffrey played, which was a four peat. But anyways, you know, they, they get the ball in the 23 following the penalty. Then they get a holding call, which backs them up and it's starting to sap this offense. And it shows, you know, they have an illegal, you know, they have a snap infraction on the next play and it just keeps pushing them back. And so, you know, they're second and 13 and staring down you know, even after gains of 14, two and two, and, uh, or I should say 14, two and five, they still face a fourth and one and they call a timeout on the three yard line going in and they get stuffed by Valor and Valor gets the ball on the three yard line, which is a very tough place to start. And that includes, you know, I, I think you can feel the jitters because Asher Wiener, he doesn't, really get a deep catch that really could have turned this game he just doesn't track the ball as well as some other receivers in the state of Colorado on the very next play though Gavin kind of helps slow down the bleeding a little bit with an 11 yard gain before being stuffed on the next play by number 10 for Greek Marte Russell who contributed very proficiently throughout this game as far as assisted tackles and full tackles go then you know he he picks up um, uh, Colton Allen. He is forced out of the pocket left, and he has to throw it back across the field to Gavin Sochuk, who has no time to react and ends up getting tackled, forcing a third and nine. And on the next play, Colton Allen, he has to roll out once again, constantly facing pressure throughout this game, and he throws a good ball, but these two Valor receivers ran into each other in what was the goofiest looney tune sc not top 10 play of the game and i think very indicative of where this valor offense's shortcomings were kind of throughout the year as far as just not having a passing attack and consistent pass catchers to you know force defenses to play honest and creek capitalizes on that and so you know creek they eat up quite a bit of time on this next drive here and you know end up punting to Valor, who gets the ball on the six yard line. So once again, not great starting field position. And Valor ends up having to punt on fourth and four after a few plays on this drive, including a 14 yard scramble by Colton Allen and 11 yard reception by Gavin Sawchuck here. And so then Creek gets the ball here and they actually end up basically going three and out here. You know, number 43, who had the tackle for loss in the first half, Carter Forsythe, he gets a sack on Christian Hammond and Creek has to punt the ball and it lands on the 28 before, you know, Colton Allen on this next drive, he finds number 45, Colton Rose, Colton the Colton connection for a 15 yard gain. And then he finds him for another one yard before throwing an incompletion and following that another incompletion and a turnover on downs, giving Creek the ball on the 30 yard line. Creek at this point is just trying to bleed the clock and get out of the game. And they end up punting further down the line before, you know, Valor gets the ball on the 31. And, you know, they get two quick first downs before getting a false start. And then an incompletion, an incompletion. And yeah, okay, look, the game ends and it is 21 to zero. Creek, Cherry Creek is your 5A state champions for the third year in a row. And, you know, they are bringing back a lot of talent. But before I jump into that, you know, Valor here, they had a solid year led by Gavin Sawchuk, obviously being their biggest prospect this year, running rampant all over the state until the Creek game for the second year in a row. Colton Allen here, kudos to him for being a, you know, a, a cool guy and a supporter of the podcast. You know, it was tough having to go up against such a great defense two years in a row you know he was doing everything he could to keep plays alive and keep his eyes downfield and try and get his receivers into the right place i should also mention that as far as this valor line goes that uh jake michaela i believe is how you say that he's a stanford commit he was holding it down on his end but there is a lot of other mismatches here on this valor line against the likes of blake purchase and company here 
uh, Caleb Perea, you know, he, there are a lot of great guys in this front seven that were giving this Valor, you know, lined fits and they constantly just found ways to get into the backfield. But, you know, obviously going undefeated is a big deal all the way through your regular season and making it to two consecutive state championships is quite a statement for a lot of these seniors, you know, uh, Jake Michaela, Luke Meyer, who made some plays this game, uh, Carter Forsyth had himself a pretty solid game on the defensive side of the ball. You know, uh, Jordan Norwood, he had 17 tackles, one sack and five tackles for loss in this game. Andrew Hale, you know, our number five safety of the senior class, he had seven tackles this game and was playing his typical, you know, multi-use kind of role in the defense once again. Forsyth and Meyer, as I mentioned, they both had two sacks in route to a three sack game from this Valor defense. And then, you know, Grant Simmons, he still ends this game with the four catches for 51 yards, but then Gavin Sawchuk catches a few more passes and gets up to 33 yards. Colton Rose turns up at the near the end of this game, going three for three for 31 yards here. And, you know, ultimately Colton Allen ends up finishing with a 50% completion percentage and 142 yards. And this Creek defense, well, hold up. Gavin Sawchuk finishes with 77 yards and 2.7 yards per carry. Colton Allen finds 58 yards on the ground, mainly on scrambles and just keeping plays alive. And, you know, ultimately this Creek defense was the biggest difference maker, intercepting the Valor offense three separate times, all from different guys, including taking one to the house. And it's hard to ignore Christian Hammond's stat line of 10 for 11 for 99 yards, two scores, zero interceptions, as well as 13 rushes for 14 yards. You know, Carlson Tan, he started to pick up a little bit in the second half, getting eight rushes for 39 yards getting up to the, like five yards per carry. Aaron Boyd kind of went a little bit silent here, uh, getting 19 total yards on the game. Jordan Heron, he got some more carries in this half and picked up a little bit more. And, you know, there was not there was only one reception for one yard in the second half. So there's not too much to talk about there. But you have Blake purchase 10 tackles, 0.5 for loss, interception, multiple batted passes, Angelo Petritus, eight tackles, two for loss. Henry, Henry Lamar, eight tackles. Tyler Tolbert, seven tackles. Chase Bragandy, six tackles, 0.5 for loss. George Fitzpatrick ends up with three tackles and a bad pass. Logan Brantley with five tackles and a tackle for loss. It was just a monster performance by this entire Creek defense, which makes this playmaker, or should I say most valuable playmaker of the state championship game hard. But ultimately, I am going to give it to two players i'm gonna take the easy way out because both these guys played phenomenally henry lamar obviously with the pick six and you know his eight tackles and being all over the field even on max preps it's listed that he had 16 tackles and his co most valuable playmaker being blake purchase who had a sack he had 11 tackles two for a loss and uh, interception that he took back 65 yards as well as two other batted passes. I'm sorry that I couldn't decide. Maybe you guys can vote and let me know who your playmaker of the game was for this 5A game. And so to kind of wrap this up here, you know, there's Creek will be back in this state championship. I'm probably calling it now. And then Valor, they're turning to the younger brother of Gavin Sawchuk. And maybe to, I don't know, you got to start doing some soul searching after getting blanked two consecutive years in the state championship and figuring out what you need to do differently in order to compete with Cherry Creek and the most dominant coach in Colorado football history. Congratulations to Dave Logan for his second three-peat of his coaching career here in Colorado, as well as his 10th total state title over four teams since 1993. So in 30 years, 10 championships, just about, well, just about 30 years, I should say. 10 championships is incredible. Kudos to that entire staff. And thank you all so much for, you know, these teams and the support. And yeah, th thanks for an awesome season here. And huge congratulations to Cherry Creek. And with all that being said, this will be our last recap of the 2021 season. And I just want to take some time on behalf of myself, Mason Austin, and Simon Villanos, aka Coach V. 
We are so, so grateful for all the support you guys have shown us. We are so grateful for all the connections that we've made and all the experiences that we've had. And we're just so ecstatic to continue our top five senior lists. You guys keep an eye out on that. We still have quite a few positions to go through. So you guys should be excited for that. And on top of that, you know, we have plenty of request episodes. If you guys are requesting a player or you want your film broken down, please DM us on Twitter or Instagram with your name, your high school, preferably your height and weight, as well as a video of your film. So we can do a breakdown whenever we start getting around to requests. We have some interviews coming out. If you are making a top five list, that is an automatic invite to interview with us on the show. We'll even interview some honorable mentions as well to kind of get your side of the story. And anyone who won a state championship, you guys are invited to interview with us on the show. We want to hear about your journey to state. And, you know, even the teams who didn't quite win, you guys are invited as well to share your story and how hungry you are either heading into that college level or, you know, coming back next year for more high school football. Once again, you can find us and DM us for interviews or requests on Instagram at Playmakers Corner, on Twitter at Playmaker Corner. We are also on TikTok where we are going to continue to post content for you guys. You guys seem to eat that up. And we are also on Facebook in case any of your parents want to check us out. And we are on playmakerscorner.com. Stay tuned for more on that website as we continue to get it developed. But we should have all of our episodes on there so you can listen to them or on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Anchor. Make sure to subscribe to those so you get notifications or follow us so you get notifications for all the latest episodes as we get ready to do our end of the year awards as well at the same time as these top five senior lists that you guys love so much. We are here for all of you. And so proud of all of these student athletes who are getting ready for graduation. And we can't wait to break down as many class of 22 guys as we can to try and get your film and your name out there and break down your strengths and weaknesses and areas of improvement and give you some kind of outlook and goals and be a resource for all of you players. Because without you guys, this podcast is impossible. We started it for you guys to get your names out there and talk about Colorado high school football and we are so glad that we did because it was such an awesome season on the 1 through 5A levels. And we all here at Playmakers Corner feel very blessed for everything you guys have provided for us. And we can't wait to get out more content for you guys and provide more around the year coverage. We are so excited. And for those who are coming back next year, enjoy your little break. Get to that off-season work and get yourself right. And to the seniors, congratulations on finishing your high school football career. You should all be proud of yourselves. All of the teams who, you know, contributed and worked hard and grinded, we respect you and you are valid. And for the last time of a recap for the 2021 season, I have been your host, Cody Stoffer. And peace out.